I just did this video once and somehow managed to delete it. So I, I guess I'll start by saying uh, I went to a couple art museums yesterday in Fort Worth. They have the uh, the Museum of Modern Art and then the Kimball Art Museum. Um, I've been wanting to do it for a while, and uh, I finally did because I haven't really been to an art museum in my life that I know of. I've been to some galleries, but so I drove down there yesterday. I first went to a bookstore in downtown Fort Worth. It was called uh, Back Backdoor Books. It was it was pretty cool. It was this old guy who had like a walker thing, and it was 3:20. I got there at 3:20 because I couldn't find any parking and looked for parking for 20 minutes, and then eventually I found parking and I had to pay five dollars. Uh, but I did it, and then. Um, I walked over to the bookstore and I walked in and the guy was talking to someone and then the guy that he was talking to left and he said, sorry, we closed 20 minutes ago. And I'm like, what? <laughs> because on the website it said he closed at four. And it was only 3.20. And he said, then he said, oh wait, it's, it's Saturday, isn't it? And he waited for me to answer. So I said, yeah, it's Saturday. <laughs> and then, um, he was like, oh, I guess we're open for a little while longer yet. So you can look around a little. So I did. Although I felt like I was imposing in a way, but whatever. I did find a couple of good books, though. I got, I figured I might as well buy something since he's, <laughs> since he probably wanted to leave. Uh, I bought a biography of Malcolm Lowry. I tried to read, um, what was it called? Under the Volcano. Uh, I did read the whole thing, but, uh, it, it was too much for myself at the time. I read it like two years ago. I need to reread it, but I, I figured his biography would help me understand it. Then I also got the collected short stories of Ernest Hemingway. In my English class, I'm in English 102 this summer, a uh, short class. Um, we read... Hills Like White Elephants, which I thought was a decent decent one. It's I'd say it was impressive because of its um, um, concentration. Like it fit quite a lot in one small section of mostly dialogue. So I thought that was good. I didn't particularly think the, the insight was insightful, but um, yeah. And then after I read that, my friend told me to read The Killers, which I thought was a much better short story than Hills Like White Elephants, but that may just be because I'm a 21-year-old male. Um, oh, and then I also got A History of Mexico, which I'm looking forward to. I've been, just for whatever reason, been reading more Mexican authors lately, uh, Octavio Paz, um, Valeria Luiselli. Uh, I've been trying to fumble my way through uh, Pedro Paramo. I think that's how you say it. In Spanish. It's not good. It's not, I mean, the book's good. I, I'm not good. Um, but. And then. Um, after I went to the bookstore I went to the Museum of Modern Art and it was pretty interesting I got a student discount so it only cost me four bucks so what's to lose for four dollars later in the day I spent four dollars on a 24 ounce bottle of coke because <laughs> well anyway but so I went to this museum and I had an hour four to five p.m. Their first exhibition was one by Frank Stella. I guess he was famous in like the 60s or 70s. Um, some of his stuff was neat. Like, kind of like the way I look at paintings by little children. 
I would say it was neat in that way, but it certainly was not good for me. I'm probably missing some um, symbolic references that if I understood them, the art would be unlocked for me, but I don't know. it. I would say it was interesting because it's kind of like a mix of sculpture and painting because he would paint on like a canvas but then he would have elevated portions like um, coming out at you and that would create some it would create an interesting dimension I suppose to it but it certainly was not worth being put in a museum in my opinion in my opinion One of his I did like, though, it was this huge painting. I think it was called The Gates of Damascus. It was this huge, like, 40 feet long, 20 feet tall, this huge thing. And it did, I think, along with the title, like, you need the title. If you just looked at it, it would be garbage. But if you look at the title and then you look at that and it's like, in real life, you're standing there. It does give you kind of like an overwhelming feeling that I would imagine a gate, like maybe the gate of Babylon. Apparently it was supposed to be really uh, elaborate and ornate. And it would probably be a very overwhelming feeling standing in front of that gate. And I said, I mean, he should have just recreated one of those gates. But that probably would have been too difficult and he probably didn't have the skill for it. So then he created, well, you can probably find it on the internet but it's just a bunch of lines painted in fluorescent paint so but I'd say that was one of the more interesting ones he also did a uh, like a five piece artwork pen pentatich trip like was the word triptych but triptych I don't know but it's a five-piece artwork on Moby Dick. And I think it was interesting because I, I've read it. And the first one was like, it looked like a like maybe the planks of a dock. And then like maybe metal rivets for a boat. And I thought that was pretty neat. Because it, it did give a feeling of, the start of Moby Dick and then the second one was like kind of where they have hope they're starting their journey maybe they think they're going to get a lot of money the second um, sculpture was I guess representative of that but then the other three I didn't understand at all I didn't understand how they went along with it the fifth one was like a huge white sculpture which was fairly obvious that that was supposed to represent Moby Dick but I don't know the book is way better than his art <laughs> so you might as well just read it but there were a couple, though, that I really did like at the museum. I didn't really like Frank Stella's stuff. There was this other one that was made, I think, in 2011. It was a naked woman sitting on a horse. And, like, the, the naked woman is facing away. The horse is looking at you. And the woman's butthole <laughs> is the center of the artwork. And there are like diagonal lines emanating from her butthole. So what that was supposed to signify, I have less than an idea about. But I just thought it was absurd that they even put it in there, honestly. And then um, opposite that, they had like 30 pieces of paper in a line, which were apparently her designs for the butthole painting. And it was just a whole bunch of drawings of a naked woman facing away, sitting on a horse, with her butthole being the center. Like 30 of them, in pencil. I have no idea what she was trying to signify with the butthole painting, but... I, I literally just started laughing when I saw that. It's like, it has to be a joke. But I did see a couple that I really did think were good. 
I can't remember the author's or the painter's name. They did have one by Jackson Pollock, which I thought was neat. They had a couple by uh, Gerhard Richter, I think is his name. I think he's famous, but they didn't. I don't know. His more like blurry paintings, which are just blurry. They had one. I can't remember who the painter was. It was a Spanish guy. But it was a painting for an elegy of Octavio Paz. And I thought that was a really neat one because I've been reading his poetry lately. I got a selection of his poetry from the library. It was it was a good painting. And then I took a couple uh, pictures of abstract ones. Um, it's kind of like those ones that's like kind of a rough representation where it's like a, maybe a pink background and then like like aggressive splotches of color. I, I like those for whatever reason. They don't really have much... I suppose they have more technique to them than something like um, Frank Stella was doing, but it's nothing nothing like, you know, a classical painting. Jacques, Jacques-Louis David, however you're supposed to say his name. The guy who painted Napoleon crossing the... The mountains, but yeah, I. And then later, I went to the Kimball Art Museum, which is mostly like classical and like eighteenth century, nineteenth century stuff. I love that way more. It was that was it was amazing. I got I was overwhelmed with being just so close to stuff that was you know like seven hundred years old. There was this painting by some, I think it was an Italian guy, seven hundred years ago. It's just unbelievable. It was like, I think painted on copper. I had no idea they painted on copper back then. They painted on copper, painted on tin. Like, I didn't, I just had no idea they did that. I guess it would preserve it better than um, whatever canvas they used back then. But they had one by Michael Michelangelo. It was The Temptation of St. Anthony, I think. So just a whole bunch of demons. Oddly enough, their buttholes were um, apparent <laughs> for the demons. Maybe that's what the meaning was for that other one. But they had some really good ones. Picasso, Cezanne, Monet, uh, Corot. There was this really neat one by... Um, I can't remember what was his name. Thomas, Thomas Couture. He, he's the one that painted the decadence of Rome, but you couldn't take pictures of some of them, I guess, to protect the artificial value of a painting and because someone paid way too much money for it. So you couldn't take pictures of the ones they donated to the um, the museum. So I couldn't take a picture of that one, the one by Couture, but it was very good. I did take a picture of one, uh, Orpheus Laments the Death of Eurydice by the Coro, I don't know if I'm saying that right, C-O-R-O, C -O -R -O. but I, that was one of my favorites there. And then another of my favorite sections was the uh, pre-Columbian exhibition. It had like Mayan pots, it had a, uh, like, not belt buckle, but what is it called? Mm. I don't know, like an ornament that you wear on your belt. It had like a scene on it and everything. There was some, uh, I don't know, like the Central American version of a frieze. It had a whole bunch of pictures of people's faces like turned to the side like an Egyptian would be. Um, yeah, that was really neat. And then I later went to this concert, had a... Went to a food truck, got some shrimp. It was a good day. Uh, enough of that. The two books I've been reading lately that kind of got me thinking about all this art museum stuff um, were The Story of My Teeth by Valeria Luiselli. I got that from the library, which is actually, I think, published last year, this year. So, But that one, it was... I loved it. It was hilarious. The main character's name is Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez. And basically, if you extrapolate that name, you get the whole book. Like, it's just absurd. And 
hilarious. I, I can't remember what he starts out as, his job, but he ends up being an auctioneer. He starts off by auctioning stuff. Well, he goes to school for auctioneering. And then he starts off by buying Marilyn Monroe's teeth, having them replaced with his teeth, and then he sells his own teeth as the teeth of famous people. Like, he ha his starts off with, the I think, a molar of Plato. So he sells that for, I don't know, a couple thousand pesos. Then he goes on to, like, the tooth uh, Marcus Aurelius. And then he goes on to tooth of Petrarch. Petrarch, or however you say his name. And then, uh, like, the tooth of Dante. And then he goes on and on. So he sells all these teeth that are his teeth, but the people believe that they're the historical people's teeth. So then they're willing to pay more. And he eventually becomes such a good auctioneer, he just starts selling names, like, you know, the verbal names. And people pay, people end up paying millions of dollars for it. And like for stories. And at one point, Valeria Luiselli becomes one of the names that is mentioned and sold for like a million pesos. It's just so funny, like, because she was apparently commissioned to write for the gallery, the Humex Gallery in Mexico City, which is a contemporary art gallery hosted by a factory that creates juice, the Humex juice. You've probably seen it in um, grocery stores. And incidentally, I tried it after reading this book, and it's it's much thicker than normal juice, but it's good. But instead of writing for the gallery, she wrote for the workers in the juice factory that fund the gallery. So she would write it in serial segments, and she would publish it. The people in the factory would give feedback. She would publish it again, feedback. So it was kind of like an interactive process for writing it. And surely that must have helped her writing voice, like her narrative voice, because it's told like, like maybe an old man um, regarding his life fondly and then telling it in like a kind of like cheeky way or I don't know. It's, it's an interesting style and it's only like 120 pages, so you should read it. But I think a subtitle or not necessarily a subtitle, but... Whenever she introduces it in interviews and stuff, she says, like, it's about the variable value of objects. And I... Oops. <laughs> Disregard that. <laughs> she, uh, the variable value of objects. And that goes along well with the other book I've been reading, The Recognitions. <laughs> um, I'm still reading it. I, I'm going slowly because... I just think it's a book that deserves to be read slowly. I'll read like maybe 20, 30 pages in a day and then think about it for a little while. There have been so many sections that I've been stuck in my head from that book. I'm only on around page 300 now. But it's just like one of the quotes... Well, one of the characters' name is Rectal Brown, which is kind of like a, a Pynchon-esque name or something. Well, it would be the other way around. Pynchon would be copying Gaddis. Not copying, but inspired by. Um, so I think Rectal Brown is talking about, you know, his forgeries that he has the main character make, yeah, that he has Wyatt make. And he says something like, Rich people only buy paintings that are expensive enough to buy. Like, so if you crank up the value of a painting, it will automatically become valuable because it costs more. So the cost artificially inflates its value, the variable value of it. And I, I was thinking about this kind of in the way of forgeries, you know, the book, because a forgery functionally, like if the layman is looking at it and if it's a forgery 
and you can't tell the difference, then the only thing that distinguishes that from the original is the story behind it, which goes along with, you know, the story of my teeth. The only thing that is distinguishing a high-class forgery from the original is the story of the original. And I just think that's, like, like almost hilarious. Like, just such, like, a farce. But kind of for a more practical look at it, my dad, he's a painter, and he draws and stuff and he sells his stuff on eBay and he doesn't get nearly enough money he doesn't he doesn't get nearly what he deserves with people like Frank Stella I'm sure he sold some of his stuff for millions of dollars my dad probably hasn't made a million dollars yet selling all of his stuff but not even close um, but it just makes me think about it because it's just all politics. Like, that's that's all the our world is, is politics. And it's so depressing. Like, mm. I feel like that's what literature is sometimes, too, because you'll hear about people like Herman Melville. He, he got popular when he wrote his first couple books, published Moby Dick. I, it didn't even sell out its first printing. And then... When he died, no one cared about him at all. And then he became popular in the 1920s, and now he's considered the, one of the best American authors. America, after the fact, has claimed him whenever they didn't when he was alive. And I just, I feel like the same amount of people that could understand him in the 1850s could understand him now, but it's just been kind of like an avalanche where all the, uh, I don't know, like, pseudo-intellectuals have, like, latched on to Melville. I don't know. <laughs> it's just really disheartening, too, because my daddy's so good, he doesn't get paid nearly enough. I just think sometimes he should just, like, create a new persona, like a pen name almost you know, raise his paintings cost by a magnitude and just start selling them. I, I, I'm i sure there's a high chance of them at being sold at that 10 times higher price. I guarantee they would be, but it would be in a way like a mm -hmm. an immoral or something like that, be, like a farce. But... And then my self-writing, you know, it's just just luck. Whether or not you become famous has nothing to do with whether you're good. Because you get people like E.L. James. What are they, a billionaire already? And then you have people like Melville dying, poor. Evan Dara, not famous. Not really that famous. Um, William Gaddis from The Recognitions. I think he got like what 10 mainstream reviews had to work in some bullshit corporate job while he wrote JR which did win him an award but yeah just really disheartening the world is not ideal <laughs> it's a shame but yeah I've really been reading Fernando Pessoa quite a lot too I brought him to the uh, the concert yesterday at the museum, and I was reading the book between. I didn't go with anyone, and everyone had like it was it was either families or boyfriend and girlfriend, and it's just like <laughs> yes, please make it more obvious, <laughs> but. Yeah, so I would read in the meantime, and there are so many good sections from Pessoa. I think I'm actually just going to read one of the good sections. I'll get it. Okay. 
This is like the first, the very beginning. I gotta get through the whole huge introduction. that every creative work is imperfect and that our most dubious aesthetic contemplation will be the one whose object is what we write. But everything is imperfect. There is no sunset so lovely it couldn't be lovelier, no gentle breeze bringing us sleep that couldn't bring a yet sounder sleep. And so, contemplators of statues and mountains alike, enjoying both books and the passing days, and dreaming all things so as to transform them into our own substance, we will also write down descriptions and analyses which, when they're finished, will become extraneous things that we can enjoy as if they happened along one day. This isn't the viewpoint of pessimists like Vigny, I don't know how to say that name, for whom life was a prison in which we wove straw to keep busy and forget. To be a pessimist is to see everything tragically, an attitude that's both, both excessive and uncomfortable. While it's true that we ascribe no value to the work we produce, and that we produce it to keep busy, we're not like the prisoner who busily weaves straw to forget about his fate. We're like the girl who embroiders pillows, for no other reason than to keep busy. I see life as a roadside inn, where I have to stay until the coach from the abyss pulls up. I don't know where it will take me, because I don't know anything. I could see this inn as a prison, for I am compelled to wait in it. I could see it as a social center, for it's here that I meet others, but I'm neither impatient nor common. I leave who will to stay shut up in their rooms, sprawled out on beds where they sleeplessly wait, and I leave who will to chat in the parlors, from where their songs and voices conveniently drift out here to me. I'm sitting at the door, feasting my eyes and ears on the colors and sounds of the landscape, and I softly sing, for myself alone, wispy songs I compose while waiting. Night will fall on us all, and the coach will pull up. I enjoy the breeze I'm given and the soul I was given to enjoy it with, and I no longer question or seek. If what I write in the book of travelers can, when read by others at some future date, also entertain them on their journey, then fine. If they don't read it or are not entertained, that's fine too. That's the third page of the Book of Disquiet. It's comforting. Uh, but sometimes I just can't believe that someone like Pessoa died. Like it's just... It just shouldn't happen. Well, anyway, this has gone on way too long. I no one's going to watch this. <laughs> uh, but hmm. death is a gang, boss. Everyone take care. <laughs>